you remember the taste of the last orange you ate? Do you remember the warmth of that welcoming cup of tea that you had when you came in from the cold November rain? Do you remember the smell of the hair of the first love that you kissed? Well, I'd like you to try and hold on to these sensations because I'm going to come back to them. But first, I'd like to try and take you on a little journey to the furthest reaches of science fiction, robotics, and artificial intelligence. When we talk about artificial intelligence, what we basically mean is the science and engineering. We're trying to engineer machines to do things that we might say is clever. And if we position the birth of the subject with Alan Turing's first attempts to draft a program to play chess in 1948, then the subject's almost 70 years old. And I've been working in it for 35 years. That's over half its life. And over that time, I've seen fashions and fads come and go. I've seen hype hit the press and fade away. But nothing has been like the excitement around AI that is crescendoing now. And that excitement's there for a reason. In 2015, the financial network company, Tungsten Corporation, chose to invest 1.5 million with me at Goldsmiths to launch a new center to use artificial intelligence to do financial data analytics, the sort of thing that Tesco's do when, when you're buying all these cards to see what you might want to, to buy next. Last year, Google invested over 400 million in a young London startup called DeepMind. And they did that for a reason. They wanted to get their hands on the very latest AI neural network technology that DeepMind were developing. This year, in 2015, Daimler tested a driverless lorry on a motorway. Now you just sit and reflect about that for a minute, a driverless lorry on a motorway, and think about the potential that has to disrupt a hell of a lot of people's lives. Think for a second how many people are involved in transport, earn their living from transport. Black cab drivers, Uber drivers, minicab drivers, delivery people. And now we're having cars and lorries that drive themselves. Well, it's in this context that in 2013, the European Union elected to invest over 1.35 billion, billion dollars with Henri Marcram to fund his Human Brain Project. Now, the idea with the Human Brain Project is that these guys would get together and, and women would get together to develop a computational infrastructure to support the development of, first, a rodent brain, and then, within the 10-year funding period, a full computational simulation of a human brain. Through this new in-silico neuroscience, there will be nothing we cannot measure. No aspect of the model we cannot manipulate. There will be no question we cannot ask. Well, this is just some advertising blurb from the Human Brain Project, but it, they're basically saying in this little video that if they're successful, there'll be no question about the brain that we can't answer with a computational simulation. And that's kind of weird. Are these people really saying that when they're finished, they'll have a computer that will really feel, that will really have emotions, that will have beliefs, that will taste that orange, that will enjoy that warmth of the cup of tea, and that will experience a first love? That they will build a machine that's genuinely conscious. Well, 
Some believe that machine consciousness is here already. Indeed, in 2002, Professor Kevin Warwick at the University of Reading led a team of cyberneticians and roboteers to develop a fleet of small mobile robots that he called the Seven Dwarves. These were simple cybernetic learning robots. Now, these robots had two little robot eyes on the front. I'm going to point at my laser at the front there. These are ultrasonic eyes that tell the robot the distance to the nearest object on its left and the nearest object on its right. And these robots have a small cybernetic brain. This is a small neural network, we call them. These are simple computational simulations of a small slice of neural or brain tissue. A mini robot brain, if you like. And the output from this neural network was used by Kevin to control these robots' limbs, their little wheels. And the strange thing is, you could put one of these robots in its corral, big sort of circular space with its chums. When you turn them on, these robots know nothing. They don't know how to interpret the data from their little robot eyes, the distances they're getting to the nearest object. They don't know how to interpret that data about their environment to enable them to move their wheels and move around without bumping into things. But one of the mysteries and magics about neural networks is if you watch them for just a few minutes, these robots learn to coordinate the data from their distance sensors with their wheels and actually move around without bumping into things. The size of these robot brains, these little neural networks, was roughly the same size as a simple animal like a sea slug. And so Kevin Warwick once said to me that it's purely raw human bias that's stopping widespread acceptance of my seven dwarf robots as being as conscious as a slug because their brain sizes are roughly the same and they're learning for themselves to do interesting things, to walk around without bumping into things. And I said, are you really saying to me that you think these machines are conscious? They're, there's something it is like to be one of these robots as it explores its corral. And Kevin said, yes, I, I think that. It, that it, as they zoom around their little corral, these little robots are experiencing zoomingness. They've got this feeling of zoom as they're whizzing around their corral. So I thought for a minute. So looking at these robots moving around, I said, imagine if I'm going to pick one of your robots out of its corral, and I'm going to put a little data recorder between the two robot eyes, which are giving the robot the distances to the nearest objects on the left and right, and I'm going to record that data as it comes into the little robot's brain. I put the robot carefully back. These machines have already learned to whiz around. It goes on its way, zooming around, experiencing zoominess. So I said to Kevin, do you think it's still... Have I done anything to stop it experiencing that sensation? And Kevin says, no, this is, that robot is still experiencing zoominess, what it's like to be a little cybernetic robot. So I grabbed the robot again, and being an evil, nasty robo-surgeon, I carefully snip the connections between the robot's eye and its brain, and I then replay it 10 seconds of the data I captured as the robot was zooming around the corral on its own. So the robot's now getting information pumped into its brain for, uh, that was recorded. And I said to Kevin, well, what do you think's happening now? And Kevin said, well, Nothing, it's exactly the same. The robot's imagining, or dreaming if you like, it's still zooming around its, its corral. It's still experiencing zoominess. Nothing has changed. But I found this kind of problematic. But to understand why it's a little problematic, I've got to take you down to the very, very, very foundations of computing and introduce to you a machine with a very weird title called a finite state automata. Now these machines are at the heart of all computing. Every computer that you use is a finite state automata. All real computers are finite state automata. So let's have a look at them. 
Now, perhaps you've seen an automaton yourself on, on TV or perhaps at a museum. On, on the video, there's an example of one called Nancy. Nancy was a, a complex 19th century stage automaton that seemed to sew. If you, I don't know whether you can see it on the video, but she's got a needle and some cloth and she's actually sewing. And when these devices were exhibited 100, 200 years ago, they caused great shock. People were genuinely freaked out by these lifelike automaton going through everyday activities. Well, <clears throat> in 1950, the English polymath Alan Turing published some work that fun uh, gives the mathematical foundations for what's going on when we look at devices like Nancy the Automaton. He described a machine called a discrete state machine, which I'm going to talk to you about now. I now call it Turing's discrete state machine because that was the first time I read about it in his work. Now, Turing's discrete state machine, please don't switch off yet because this is really easy peasy, is like a clock with an hour hand. And this clock, on every tick of the clock, the hour hand will go from the 12 o'clock position to the 8 o'clock, to the 4 o'clock, to the 12 o'clock, to the 8 o'clock, to the 4 o'clock, to the 12 o'clock, to the 8 o'clock, to the 4 o'clock, you get the idea. Now, Turing realized that he could characterize the behavior of this device computationally. He said, let's imagine that when the machine hand is at the 12 o'clock position, I'm going to call that being in computational state A. When it's in the 8 o'clock position, I'm going to say it's in computational state B. And when it's in the 4 o'clock position, computational state C. Now, to describe what's going on, we just give a couple of simple if statements. I think you might be able to guess what they are. If the machine's in computational state A, at the next clock tick, it goes to B. And if the machine's in computational state B, at the next clock tick, it goes to computational state C. And if the machine's in computational state C, at the next clock tick, it goes back to computational state A. Now, Turing also imagined that we could get these devices to do things, to control things, like Nancy the Automaton. So just imagine that whenever the, the Turing's discrete state machine is in computational state A, a light is made to come on. Perhaps when it's in computational state B, a hooter might sound. If you have a lot more computational states than three, you might sequence in that way a whole list of complex actions. In that way, you can program a list of complex actions to unfold over time. Now, recall, I said that finite state automata, discrete state machines, lie at the heart of all computing. But before you want to throw away your shiny new powerful laptop and replace it with a Turing's discrete state machine, reflect that a discrete state machine without any input is actually a pretty boring device. All this thing can do is go through the states A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. You'd have a job playing Quake or Doom or a flight simulator on that device. But Turing had kind of gained this a bit. He imagined having some input to his device. And he imagined, because he was thinking mechanically, he thought, I'll imagine having a great big mechanical brake that can come on. If the machine's in computational state A and the brake's on, at the next clock tick, guess what happens? It stays in computational state A. If the machine's in computation, uh, otherwise it goes to computational state B. If it's in computational state B, at the next clock tick, it will stay in B, and if the brake's off, it will go to C. If the machine's in computational state C and the brake's on, it will stay in C, otherwise it will go back to A. Now, this mere addition of an input has transformed the computational power of this device from a simple system that could only go through an unchanging sequence of state transitions, A, B, C, A, B, C, with input, it becomes sensitive to its input. And it transpires that the number of possible state sequences that Turing's machine can generate with input grows combinatorial with time. And basically, what that means is after a very short period of time, the number of different state sequences it can generate exceeds the number of atoms in the known universe. Now, what's perhaps not quite so obvious is that we can simulate the behavior of any discrete state machine with any other discrete state machine. Let's take one that you're all familiar with, a modern car's digital marlometer. 
to simulate Turing's discrete state machine without input, with a myelometer, all we need to do is to set it so that when the myelometer is in state one, when there's one mile on the clock, we say that this Turing's machine is in state A. When there's two miles on the clock, we say it's in state B. When there's three miles on the clock, we say it's in state C. When there's four miles on the clock, we say it's back in state A. When there's five, it's in B. And when there's six, it's in state C. So over any short time period, we can replicate the behavior, the different state transitions of Turing's discrete state machine with any other one, such as a digital myelometer. But because when we added input, the number of possible state sequences grew exponentially, we can't easily do the same thing when you have a machine with input. But then I realized that if we know the input to one of these machines, just like we knew the input to one of Kevin Warwick's robots when I played back the data that was sent to it, if I know the input to one of these machines, that combinatorial state structure collapses again just to a simple list of state transitions. Imagine Turing's machine that's in, if I know that the brake's on for the first clock tick and off thereafter, and I know it starts in state A, I know it's going to go A, A, B, C, A, B, C. In other words, I can predict it. I can predict what it's going to do. It's just a simple list of state transitions. And that means I can replicate the behavior of that with a myelometer. I just have to say, when the myelometer's reading one, it's in A. When it's reading two, it's also in A this time. When it's reading three, it goes to B. When it's reading four, it goes to C. And there I've replicated the behavior of Turing's discrete state machine with input with the car's myelometer. Now, in 1988, the influential American philosopher Hilary Putnam published a paper in which she showed that under the influence of gravitational waves and cosmic rays, the subatomic particles that make up all the objects of our world your seat, the seat you're sitting on, the very clothes you're wearing, the room that we're in, they're all um, containing a rich dance of subatomic particles, a dance that never repeats itself. And Putnam realized that this is analogous to a, a state machine going through an infinite series of non-repeating states. It's kind of analogous to a lot, you can't see these slides of coming up very weird today, but this is kind of analogous to the behavior of these lotto balls. You'll see them dancing around in a pattern that never repeats. So, if we can think that the particles in this room are going through a series of states that never repeat, that's the equivalent to saying we've got a system that goes through an infinite number of non-repeating states. So, it then seems to me that if a computer, a terminator perhaps, is conscious purely as a result of moving through a series of computational state transitions, then if I know the input to that machine, with input fixed, I can generate exactly the same series of state transitions with any large counter like a car's myelometer or following Hillary Putnam's move with any open physical system. So if a machine is conscious merely as a result of following some computation, then consciousness is everywhere. In the bricks of this building, the clothes that you're wearing, the very seat you're sitting on, they are all experiencing the zing of that orange, the warmth of that cup of tea, and the memory of your first love's kiss. If machine consciousness is possible, everything, even the smallest grain of sand, is filled with an infinitude of conscious experiences. Thank you.